Ready? One second. It's recording. It's recording. <laughs> Good evening, Jim. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you, more importantly? <laughs> I'm doing good. And yes. uh, it's a Sunday today, and uh, we're here to do our eighth episode of Unforced Air. And today we're going to talk... UFE. UFE? Yeah, I like that. That's pretty good. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a wrap up the Australian Open. We just finished last week. And you've got your rule change for you the have end? you. I got loads. We're ready then. Okay. So, let's start by talking about the Australian Open, which was a very exciting Australian Open. What do you think? Well, very different for a start, wasn't it? With the um, Sadly, with the bushfires, the kind of backdrop in the lead up to it, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the lower ranked players um, in qualifying saying, you know, would... Would the big boys and the big ladies have to play in these qualifying conditions? Um, a few people uh, retiring through smoke inhal inhalation. So for the wrong reasons, that, that kind of made it memorable. It's a shame because Australian Open is a, a tra tradition of a friendly tournament. So it's, it's bad luck was visited on the tournament. But um, my overall impression uh, really is that we were waiting for the big breakthrough yet again of the new up-and-coming players uh, after Titsipas won the ATP Tour Finals. We thought, right, this is their time. And uh, we were left uh, at the end of the tournament with a bit of a tease, really, because there were signs of some of the new players coming through in the men's field and definitely in the women's field, but also a sign that the old guard are still strong. And sometimes it's only the old players can only get knocked out by another old player. So it was a mixed bag. And yeah, as you say, interesting. What about you, David? After Titsipas winning ATP, were you expecting him and Medvedev to be the ones coming through? But it didn't quite work out that way, did it? It didn't. I was very excited about this Australian Open. And even every commentator on TV was talking about it. Everybody was almost with this feeling of expectation that finally something was going to give and uh, they were going to finally break one of the top three guys that have been dominating all the Grand Slams. Yeah. And most of the way till the finals, we were pretty close. And then we reached the final, which had a possibility of getting there. The old versus the new. The old versus the new. It's always exciting because... But not quite the new we were expecting, maybe. Not at all. And our predictions went down the toilet. Can you remember our, our predictions? I what, can, what very we well. Embarrass me and yes, embarrass and, yourself. And Stephen as well. Steve, he's, he's, not, he's so embarrassed he's not here tonight. <laughs> yes, exactly, Stephen. What's, what's up the with one that? is laughing there, but uh, <laughs> he's, he's absent. So we all went for Curious as a wild guess. Wishful thinking. Yes, wishful. Didn't I mean, do badly, did he? He was playing for the team, for the whole nation, and it yeah. felt like... He, he put some know. aces in the bank, because um, the aces were, were for charity, so he did... Yeah, yeah, he, he justified his seeding, didn't he? And uh, did. Yeah. So just recap, Kyrgios, and he had a few exciting Medvedev. matches, and then he went out to, to Nadal, which he, uh, who he's called a, a salty player. Yes. You know, so there was no, maybe arguably no love lost between them before the match, but afterwards it was all hugs and handshakes and Kyrgios impressed at the times of that match, but it was Nadal who prevailed. There's something special that happened with Kyrgios this Australian Open, and it has to do with the bushfires and how he reacted. All this that was happening kind of showed some sort of new Kyrgios that we are not expecting to see only in team game he normally plays like this there was no you know moments of disconnection from the matches he was mostly focused from the first point to the last of each match he played he contained himself he didn't talk and entertain himself with the crowd so i have a feeling that he's starting to take tennis a little bit more seriously and it has to do with what happened with australia at the moment he was connected wasn't he he was, he was connected, connected to the crowd he was the serious. moments and the tournaments I hope that we want a curious of old as well, but maybe that focus could now come in handy for the rest of the year. 
My worry with uh, someone with uh, like Kyrgios, who um, you know has has uh, such a butterfly mind and so many probably so many interests outside tennis, like basketball. You almost think tennis is a hobby for him sometimes. Is he going to be satisfied being the world number fourteen for the next six or seven years? For someone like him, uh, you know, obviously quite a thinker. He showed real leadership in the Australian Open with organising the the charity events to support the bushfire victims is he going to be happy being a, a joe wilfred songer gail monfils gilles simon type player knocking around the top 20 you know sometimes in the race for the atp top eight is that going to satisfy him for in the years to come that's my worry with kyrgios yeah i listened to a podcast a few months ago i don't remember the name but someone was interviewing Curious. And he suggested that maybe the reason why he's not taking it so seriously is a fear of failure, which makes sense. But Curious immediately, you know, countered yeah. saying that it was not. But yes, yeah. to what extent is Curious really? So he goofs around sometimes. Is it because, because uh, he'd, he'd rather lose and have people go, well, he wasn't really trying, he could have won, than yeah. give it his all and still lose. Yes, yeah. maybe yeah. there's I something there to too. his personality. I'm not sure. I never met yeah. Curious. We're not very sure about that, but... But it, he did He did well. He justified feels... his seeding and um, people, you know, really warmed him during the tournament. Hopefully he won a few people around. Let's just recap for viewers what, what happened to the two great white hopes, Titsipas and... Medvedev, they both went out. Uh, one went out earlier than the other. But remind <clears> me, David, who who did Tsitsipas go out to? Raonic was it? He Raonic, could not do ah, anything. Yeah. You see, your question leads to another interesting topic, which is there was a few good surprises in this tournament on the ladies' side and on the men's side. The surprises were almost like, oh, it's not another new young player coming through. I've never heard of him. Oh, that's great. He's got through. It's the surprise was an old player we'd forgotten about, yes. Ranic or Varinka, yes. beating one of the new poster boys. Yes. And even Zverev? Nobody yeah. was expecting no, it. No, absolutely not. A first not. Grand Slam without best of fives? How is that yeah, even possible? Well, before the tournament, he played in the ATP Cup. It was a disaster. And it was a, he could barely get a serve over. He was Nothing. serving very slowly and still not getting them it in. It was incredible. Hitting the middle of the net on his serves. Yeah. He wasn't speaking to Becker, the coach, the tournament. Nothing. Becker didn't know what to do. If I was a betting man, I would have put a lot of money on Zverev losing in the first round of the yes. Australian Open. Or... Okay, he's done really well, but he's going to lose to Varenka, who was resurgent and in great mm -hmm. form in the quarterfinals, beats, but he, and beats. in good form against Zverev, Zverev in that match. Oh my God, what but a match Zverev that was! Zverev turned it round and with a set to spare, wasn't it? Four sets. Yes, he turned it around just like you said, and I've never seen Zverev on a Grand Slam where he wins most of his matches in three sets. There's yes. something wrong with him. Something clicked, and um, Vavrinka eliminated one of our predictions. Medvedev, we yeah, good, very good game, very good match. Medvedev didn't play that badly no, either. No, Medvedev he? was there. He lost but, the first um, set, then he won the next two, and then yeah, Varenka just found reminded something. us what a great, what a great player. Yeah, he is. And then uh, Ranić uh, too. I mean, we'd forgotten about him. Just couldn't get a handle on the serve at that all. That match just... was strange. Yeah, I cannot believe how powerless Tsitsipas was made to look by it's, Ranic. He couldn't do yeah. anything. He couldn't break. Couldn't it's worrying because there are other Ranic's out there, aren't there? Other <sighs> other great servers. I know. So, you know, he's, if he can't get a handle on servers like that, then he's going to be involved in a lot of tie-break kind of conclusions to sets, really, which is just a kind of roll of the dice sometimes, whether you whether you win or lose and up to how, how well you're serving. So that the um, Australian had a new surface this year, I think I was reading earlier today, and it's traditionally been faster than the US Open. So I wouldn't have thought that would favour people like Nadal and Dominic Team because they do well on uh, on clay, on the slower surfaces, yes. really. But I was wrong there. It was another hunch of mine. I thought it would favour the Federers of this world, the people who like playing on fast surfaces. I did have my suspicion that Dominic Team would just be a one-trick pony, great on clay, the man to take on Nadal. But it didn't work out that way, did it? Team was probably the best story of the of the tournament. Of course, Djokovic is always the same story. The guy is just the perfect player for tennis. I'm not saying the most beautiful to watch. It's just efficiency to 
almost 100%. But the team did ever so well, I think. I wasn't expecting him to do so well in the tournament. He beat Nadal, which is maybe the subplot there. You look back on the tournament, I lost to Djokovic. I thought team was going to beat Djokovic at one stage in the final when he was two sets to one up. He seems to be playing well in that fourth set. But if he can beat Nadal at the Australian Open, do you think that could be translated to the clay of France? Do you think he could beat Nadal at the French Open? We were Open? saying that he was a great surprise in this Australian Open, wasn't he? And the way that he's hitting his bullets, I mean, those are missiles, yep. left and right, forehand and backhand, it doesn't matter. Backhand's beautiful. Beautiful. And, I mean, give that backhand to Feather and he would probably have all the slams in the whole damn yeah. world. That backhand yeah. is insane. Yeah. So, I have to commend Tim reaching the final. But now to answer your question, I believe, then again, here we go with strange predictions, Tim is the guy to beat Nadal in the final of the... French this year open one thing that changed over the years team used to be this kid that just hit bullets all the way and then would start missing and then he was chaotic and in the end and he would lose he has evolved in his mindset he's taking a different kind of approach Djokovic got a uh, quite a lot of adverse news coverage I noticed in the final because there was an instance in the final he touched the umpire's feet at one stage and said well well done you've made yourself a hero after the umpire kind of acted out uh, the rules which is there's a, a stopwatch there you've taken too long for a serve it was a first serve now it's a second serve and uh, I read in one newspaper but it was the Guardian Kevin Mitchell of the Guardian who's a tennis writer he said that um, Djokovic's behaviour, he did seem to compare it with Serena Williams' behaviour against Azarka in the US Open final, which I thought was a bit much. I don't think it was as bad as that at all. It was just 15 seconds Djokovic of kind of querying the rule, having a little tantrum, getting it out of his system and then moving on and he recovered very quickly. What did you think of the instance in the final? Do you think people are right to... Um, to dislike Djokovic, why isn't he popular? Does he deserve to, you know, not to be as popular as Federer and Nadal and others? Yeah. So about that incident, I wouldn't judge it at all. I think it was just a moment of insatisfaction. He was actually not aggressive. He was actually very. He was cute, touching the. Is the it a good rule? Should he should he been penalised for taking time? Yeah. I think if there's a stop clock, it's for a reason. Yeah. You, you... And then you have to follow the rules. Of course, sometimes umpires can let go a little bit. Yeah. But and... I agree with you. If the law is there, you know, well done to the umpire for enforcing it. I think you yes. should do that. I think it was overblown, but I think it's symptomatic of uh, kind of people are looking for reasons to dislike Djokovic. And I do feel sorry for him. Sometimes he seems to be quite alone on court. It seems like whoever he's playing, most of the fans, especially the neutral fans, want his opponent to win. And that's not true of Federer and Nadal, although, you know, they're playing against underdogs. They're the favourites in every sense of the word with the crowd in most of their matches. Yes. So I feel sorry for Djokovic and I think he's an amazing player who maybe doesn't get the credit he deserves. Maybe it's something about his character that is less attractive than Nadal or Feather. Maybe there's something historic about Nadal and Feather that goes on for too long, that overpowers the love for Djokovic. Yeah, I think maybe crowds know that maybe this is cruel. They can get under Djokovic's skin. They can push his buttons. And yeah, he will lose his cool. It might make him play better, but he will have a little outburst, a few Always. swear words and expletives. Some fans, they see going to a tennis match as their opportunity to let off steam. They're not in the office anymore. They can uh, let go let go of some testosterone. And, you know, then Djokovic lets off some steam and it's, uh, that's not good. It's incredible. Djokovic has something about him that refuses to lose. So, going back to the Australian Open, Zverev was a great surprise. Hopefully he's getting and giving us um, hope would you, for Would you like that? Do you want him to be up there? It's funny because when I started seeing Zverev play well this tournament, I was like satisfied. I was happy, happy with it. For him, yeah. yeah, because he has potential. He really yeah. has. He has an insane serve. He's really tall, lean, moves yeah. around very well. He has a great yeah. backhand. Only his mind needs to connect. Yeah. So if somebody is to break, somebody has to. Yeah. So whoever it is, I'm happy. I'm at the stage that I'm happy any one of these guys 
But you want uh, Federer still to win some more Grand Slams as well, so you... I do, although I would love for suddenly, say, Kyrgios or Medvedev or somebody to just start winning them all. And then suddenly none of the three would have a say, and I would be happy with that. <laughs> There's a problem here, Jim. It's very important for the new ones to beat the old guard before the old guard disappears. I mean, wouldn't it be sad if suddenly a new Grand Slam winner would be after these guys have retired? Or they're too old to play yeah. tennis? Psychologically, it wouldn't be good for someone to take over, having it wouldn't be not to post they've succeeded because the old king is dead and not only would be great for tennis we love yeah. this we love for the for the new heroes to be the old heroes yeah we don't want them to be leftovers yeah you know well, i mean uh, federer beating sampras at wimbledon all those there years ago in 2001 it gave it some legitimacy whereas Hewitt was kind of king in the vacuum of sampras yes. uh, there you go retiring but he, he filled a vacancy Mm -hmm. rather than toppled someone there in, you in a prize yeah. fight. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that is important. Is. So where does this leave us in the chase for the Grand Slams of all time? Can you, will you predict how many Grand Slams do you think Djokovic will win when he Djokovic, retires? You tell me. Djokovic is going to win them all. The only way for Djokovic to be stopped has to be one of the new guys. Because now no. Djokovic has mental edge on Federer and Nadal. He's like the nemesis of those two. Yeah. It has to be a new guy with new energy that comes and becomes the nemesis of Djokovic. Yeah. What do you think? You think it's... I just wonder if there is a new guy out there who we've mentioned tonight yeah. who can stop Djokovic. I just wonder whether scientists will have to breed a new guy under a Petri dish <laughs> as we speak. And it might be a few years before he rolls off the production line. Yes, he exactly. might be out there somewhere listening. So I do worry about that. Uh, but yeah, I, I wasn't saying this six months ago. I think Djokovic will be the one with the most Grand Slams. There. Me too. Same thing. It's crazy to think that way. It's incredible, but it's so realistic. So, okay, that was a great Australian Open for the men. What about the women? We have some interesting things to talk about. Before we get into names of women for the Australian Open, yeah. we've talked about this. Is it good or bad that women have a new Grand Slam winner every, every slam, almost? In one way, men having these amazing rivalries between two or three or four players keeps us hooked onto some stories that we like to follow. Whereas in women, it's also good because it's open. There's a positive side to it, isn't it? Because it's open and we like to see open, but then again, they miss out on having those great stories like a Serena story or a Martina Ingi story or a Steffi, Steffi Graf. Graf's. Yeah. So we haven't had stories like that in a while now. It's only Serena there knocking on the door. And other than that, it's new Grand Slam here, new Grand Slam there. Very and, uh, interesting uh, debate, I, yeah. The reason why I'm asking this is because who won <laughs> the, this Australian Open came from nowhere. I mean, even the two finalists came from nowhere. Muguruza was playing yeah. the best. She just came out of the blue. She disappeared after winning a Grand Slam. I like the I liked lady. her as well. I yeah. like her. And she was playing incredible tennis. It just makes tennis. you think, why isn't she there in the semi-finals of every Grand Slam? I know. Tour? Something happened. Where's she been? Has she been kidnapped? How, and then could, how could suddenly, anyone beat her in the first round and the second round? It's yeah, just, crazy. Yeah. And then she appeared and she's in the final. That was already a great surprise. Another surprise. And then... Yeah. The champion, Kenin. Yeah, so Sophie. Sophia Kenin, a new winner. How open is the WTA tennis at the moment? And is this good? Is this bad? Do we want this for the men's to start happening? Just to open up, would we like to see that? And uh, what did you think about the Australian Open with the women's? Some very exciting matches, really. You know, you'd, uh, you'd watch the first set of a... Uh, take any match on any day in the women's there'd, there'd be a couple of matches where you'd see someone completely on top in the first set go out and make a cup of tea and come back and the other ladies won in three sets yes Goff finally having the vengeance yeah, over Osaka that was a big turnaround because uh, Osaka beat her very handily mm -hmm. uh, at the US Open what a difference three or four months can make yes 
Yeah. But to get back to your original question about is it good for the ladies' game to have a revolving cast, I was very pleased that Kenan, great tennis name, isn't it? Because there was Justine Enan. So there's a tradition there, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So Kenan, I thought she was making up the numbers when I saw her in the quarterfinals. It's yes. like, okay, you know, well done for getting so far. Kind of yep. quite ungainly server. It looked like her shoulder was going to hit her ear when she was throwing the ball up. But fantastic. She just wasn't going to lose that final when she was down. She was really cheering herself up and still staying focused. And uh, she was going to go down all guns blazing if she was going to lose. And she didn't lose. So fantastic for her. But I think women's tennis needs a rivalry. And it hasn't got that. The closest it's come to it really in recent years is Sharapova versus Serena Williams. But that was a, a kind of Hello Magazine type rivalry. It was like them kind of criticizing the other's lifestyle choices and making catty remarks about yes, boyfriends it wasn't a rivalry which translated for the most the part no. onto the tennis court no. which was a real shame last uh, rivalry mega rivalry was what the William sisters well rivals have, have suddenly appeared uh, for uh, Serena Williams and then just disappeared again Justin and Anne Halep, did very well for a while Shalapov, and then uh, Ritar, Kleisters Azarenka. Kleisters gave her a bloody nose and then just re- keeps on retiring each time each time yes. she does it like and a, Azarenka was the one that was fearless against uh, yeah. Serena and suddenly she's just taking time off so it's great we have this cast of people uh, uh, coming up and winning the being number one and uh, winning these titles but it's like James Bond. It would be great if there was a new James Bond every film, but it's not really good for the brand, is it? You no. want you want someone there so the man on the streets can go, oh, yeah, they can talk about these players down the pub. How many of the top eight who played in the year-end finals for the women could the man on the street name? I would struggle to name them. I think a bit more continuity would be nice. It'd be great. Not every sport can have the Djokovic, and Nadal, Federer, triumvirate the the holy trinity there but just have a two rivals at the top of the women's game which side are you on i think that would be good for women's tennis and it hasn't had that for a long time even with venus and serena their matches look staged and we're often very one-sided anyway so i really think they need a rivalry a strong cast at the top rather than these new people who appear from nowhere and then disappear back to nowhere yeah that's what i think it's well said, you know, names like Barty, which she's been showing and winning some championships. Halep has been also yeah, fighting. Yeah, and she, r- she is a, a kind of constant up there, which is great. Yeah, so Halep has been there as well in the reaching finals, winning some tournaments. But then, yes, when it gets to this slams and to the overall year, you don't look back into the WTA and you remember these great stories of two or three meeting in the finals and doing everything to beat each other. We get so excited. Osaka versus Williams. Oh my God, something is happening. Suddenly, it's it's over. Yeah. They need a Chris Everts, Martina Navratilova type rivalry, mm. I think. Uh, and even, even that got one-sided uh, towards the end. It's often with these rivalries, yeah, just a pattern emerges, unfortunately. Mm, yes. And again, uh, with our great men's game, you know, that has been the difference. Federer has lost a lot of games and then suddenly came back and started beating Nadal and Djokovic. Yes. So lots of twists in the men's games, which are sadly perhaps lacking the women's games, but some great matches, some Still. some very memorable matches in this year's very. Australian Open uh, women's tournament. To give props to Kenin, she was impressive. Young, yeah. you were 21 years old, aggressive and somehow with the mindset to win is she going to start dominating? Is that even possible? I hope so. I, I thought that about uh, her opponent. I thought her opponent was, was there to stay and, uh, you yeah. know, winning the French and Wimbledon so close together, mm-hmm. but then just didn't kick on a- after that. So yeah. I hope she's back. I hope they're both back. I'd like to see them in, in more finals. I think it was a really good final. I think they're both really good players. Exactly. Yeah, I hope the winner does win again. With that determination, it'd be weird if she didn't, but we've seen this before in women's tennis. Yes. Someone uh, a few years ago, that lady who won the French Open from nowhere. 
I can't even remember her name now. Was it Ostapenko? Yes. And God, you you would think she'll win every match. She every just, match. She just can't lose. Well, where is it she now? It was amazing. Yeah. That uh, French Open was amazing. But they grow players like that in greenhouses in Florida, don't they? There's just <laughs> an army of them. Yes. And so then these players get swallowed up. It's a shame, yes. Yeah. What stood out to you at this Australian Open? What stood out for me, uh, unfortunately, and I hate to end on a, on a negative note, which isn't really the, the Australian Open's fault, but I find it, it's the hardest to watch of all the Grand Slam tournaments. For a nine-to-fiver, and I know we're not all nine-to-fivers, some people work other working patterns, and that's perfectly acceptable, but uh, the matches would just be kicking off when it's time to set off for work. So, yeah, very frustrating in that regard. You know, the big night matches would be, um, you know, starting off about half eight. And most people are setting off for their nine to five job then. So I think that's my memory because you forget each year. It's amazing how you watch something and you just forget, oh, God, this is a really difficult tournament to watch and juggle with real life and not find out the result. So I've done a lot of... Um, a lot of going to work and telling people, please don't tell me what the result is, <laughs> which must be really frustrating for them. So I apologise to them and you, David, because I've done that to you too. But I find it's a hard tournament to watch. I loved watching it, but what was your abiding memory? Okay, so what stood out for me, it's difficult to say. I was hoping for the new, you know, the new Grand Slam winner. Maybe what stood out for me this beginning of this year is actually the realisation that Djokovic will be the best of all time. Something feels that way after this win. Djokovic was almost unfazed the whole tournament. And even when he was challenged, he came up with a new new trick coming back from behind. So that stood out for me that maybe the time is coming where after a generation of almost 10 years of Feather dominating and then Nadal coming, and creating this incredible rivalry, dominating tennis, and we think to ourselves for years, these are going to be the two best players of all time. Suddenly we have the third. And yeah. it might be this guy named Djokovic. If so, he wants it. If he wants it. And if he stays injury-free. Yes. Who can stop him? Nobody. He is, he like is that. so hard to kill. So You've hard. got match points uh, against him. And yeah, you know, use them. Get that first match point because he's just... In, use them. Absolutely right. Uh, You've got to use... As Federer knows now to his cost three times. So just incredible. Phenomenal. And yeah, no, f fair play to him. For fair all the, play. In... All the hard work al allied with that natural ability, which has taken him to the, the peaks of Mount Olympus. Yeah. He came from the Up there with Federer and Nadal and yes. soon to be soaring over them like a, like a giant <sighs> Serbian eagle. I'm a big fan of Federer, but... If Djokovic surpasses him like that, I'll applaud and I'll say well done. Absolutely. They had great lives and great tennis lives as well. So, hey, they should be happy for whatever whatever they already achieved. Yeah. Maybe one day they'll all go down the pub together and uh, have a pint. Um, yes, and laugh and about reminisce it. And reminisce. They've all got plenty of trophies in their cabinets, yes, haven't they? It's true. And, then, you know, we all die at the end. Yeah. Grand slams or no grand slams, you know. Hey, yeah. you lived your great life and then move on. Who knows, maybe in 100 years there will be 40 Grand Slam winners. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. I doubt it, though. <laughs> I think I think we'll look back on this as a special time and say... I'll tell you how. My God, why didn't I get that extra Eurosport package? How could I miss any of the great threes? It's true. Look, I think that in 100 years, 200, 500 years, we're going to live a lot longer and there's going to be space and time to win a lot more Grand Slams because then tennis careers will not be only until the 30s or 40s, it will be until the 50s and 60s. And maybe, yeah, if they, they kind of freeze the, the DNA of Federer or some, <laughs> something, he can still have a handle on, on the trophies. Yes. Somebody goes to the coffin of Feather in yeah. 200 years and creates Feather number two. Yeah. Improved. Uh, yeah, <laughs> with a mega team, with, with Dominic a, team's backhand. With a proper backhand. Yes, yeah, we're, with we're a proper backhand. Great minds think alike there. <laughs> Okay, so let's end up in uh, our little change for today. And uh, you go, f well, here's the music and then... Talking about rule change. Talking about... You go first. 
My rule change on this dark and stormy night is the abolition of a, a terrible invention which has plagued tennis for many centuries now, ever since it was invented by a Frenchman. It is, of course, juice. Oh, wow. An, an evil word. I don't even like saying the words because it sends a shiver down my spine. Perhaps more specifically, maybe not juice so much as advantage. I think I hate to see a match just log jammed in a stalemate at juice. Not too bad if it's five all in the final set. Exciting. But if you're one all in the first set on a rainy Monday in a first round of a club tournament and you're just stuck at juice back and forth for about 15 minutes what is the point really the life goes on beyond the gates of the tennis club <laughs> and i would like to see as it has been introduced in doubles. i think grand slams doubles matches sudden death at juice now i'm gonna shoot myself down by saying the disadvantage of that is that it would make uh the end of the game early on in the set more sudden death than the tie break where you have to have two clear points to get to seven but i think it's a small price a price worth paying for ridding the world of the evil that is <laughs> juice and advantage and juice and advantage we'll cut this bit down david no you so can go on i'm on. fully expecting you to say that you don't approve of that going into the rule change uh room so let me hear your thoughts great i did not expect that rule change at all and uh, I think it's probably going to be the first time that I disagree with one of your um, rule changes because, of course, as yes, we already spoken about it, you are good I'm at the them. guy that loves to see. <laughs> thanks. I'm the guy that loves to see the players go to the extreme. Get, in human let me beings. T tell you this. Uh, yeah. uh, let me ask you this. Uh, it's a frank question. Yeah. Do you ever get so fed up of it going juice advantage, juice advantage? Do you ever just? give up a game because you just never, want to start a new ever. game have you ever been tempted no never even when really tired Not in even the close. height of summer Those are the moments that i get more excited do you think your opponents ever do that they just go yes i'm I've, so I've fed seen up with this i'm going to mm -hmm. start a new game i'm going to mm -hmm. give this game up yeah sometimes yeah. you can do that isn't it I mean, I don't play at a professional level, so I can't really compare the deuces from those guys with the deuces from our guys. But for me, when I'm down or when I'm in a long deuce, it becomes more and more exciting to win it. And more and more important to win it. As well. So those moments define the matches for me. And it's very common that when somebody wins a long deuce, then it breaks next game normally he has some mental advantage over the opponent. So it would take something out of the tennis that I'm used to watch. Having said that, I'm not really completely against your suggestion because I like when you said like, okay, let's just decide. There, you have a point, use it. You see what I mean? It's like, okay, yeah. just do it. I mean, it, why are we here forever and ever? So I think for me, it's just because I like that extreme. I watch shows of survival. I read books about people getting lost in the deserts and having to walk for miles and miles to stay alive. So I like this kind of tests. So yeah. the tennis gives me a little bit of that, who will survive this 10 hour match? Will. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I'm not against it completely, but I definitely would suggest that it continues forever. And I would bring back two clear, games. Two clear games in the Grand Slam. Stop doing this to tennis but well, hey, i agree i agree with you I there actually it. i know that's contradictory i'll but tell I, you something I, yeah i would let's mix your suggestion with my suggestion about your suggestion okay always have sudden death deuces until five all but in the deciding games where one can win the set five four or at five fall or at five six introduce the deuce back because That's then bad idea, yeah. because then yeah. they have the, that chance to really fight for that important game and especially the last set just like you said that one all okay whatever yeah but then there comes a time where that point is so important that you you want to win with two points ahead i like that compromise there i think the advantage of my idea is it would cut down the length of a tennis match which a lot of people are in favor of it's maybe true. by 10 maybe by 10 percent in some matches or more and or that more. might enable women to play best of five sets <laughs> that's easily. that's a great talk but maybe for, that's maybe that's not a good thing not everyone wants that to that's happen. a great talk for so for the yeah, show we have another, to talk show. about that so your rule change david 
All right. So my rule change. It's going back to the past. I'm missing a little Wooden bit. Wooden tennis rackets. No, with umpiring. So the way I'm seeing the world, society in itself, how it's evolving with the way that parents educate children, the society educates us, and the tennis matches are going. I mean, the whole world is shifting into this place where everything is controlled. And it's removing our true human nature of experimentation and true emotion. And I would remove all these new warnings that the umpires are giving the players. Such as? Smashing a racket. I mean, just smash the damn racket if you want. <laughs> it's unbelievable that we cannot express emotion it. anymore. They paid for it. And not only, we've seen it happen so many times. You smash the racket and sometimes you get it out of... I'm well, not... What about it damages? A splinter goes and hurts a baby in a pram. Oh my God, it or... never happened. So I'm not really bothered with that. During a long game with lots of juices and someone smashes their racket yes. and hurts a ball boy or something. Well, look, the world is a dangerous place. You know, a comet can come and hit yeah. Earth anytime. We're not going to stop living because of that. That's true. Okay. I I, am, any other warnings? That... Yes, but I am the, you know me, I'm the player that never breaks a racket. I think, but I love yeah. the fact that, I mean, why a warning? You just, do you remember Magdati's? Destroying seven rackets in a row or eight. Did he do that? Really? He, uh, yeah. he sat down. I think I've seen a clip. He sat yeah. down and grabbed one by one and broke them all. So I he mean, had no rackets left. That was an epic moment. I don't remember that part, but it's just, it brings this, why can't Ooh. we be ourselves a little bit more? We're trying to uniform the personalities into one way. And uh, there are people that are more emotional than others. The, the thing about Baghdad is um, smashing up seven rackets is... I just think, how much should tennis and other sports set an example to children? For instance, it wouldn't be good for a kid to smash that racket. Their parents might have saved up to buy it for their birthday. Mm -hmm. They haven't got seven rackets to mm -hmm. smash up. Yeah. So f from that point of view, it's setting a bad example. You could say boxing, well, that sets a bad example. So that's maybe not the best one. But maybe tennis, tennis maybe should mirror ordinary life kind of thing i mean my, my rule change is probably the opposite of yours i think i proposed before that if someone smashes a racket they've got to carry on playing with that racket till the end I of the like game i like that that's which cool is kind well. of the opposite that's but cool. do you think do you think tennis should have rules so it can be set an example to to young people to people watching or do you think that's not the role of tennis i think we're creatures more than anything else and we're living on a planet and we deserve yeah. so to, it's, it's, it's to separate, be natural. It's, 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 tennis should be a way of letting off steam. And, uh, no, that's almost putting all the emphasis on the steam. Tennis is about tennis. But yeah. there's moments where we can break a record. Another one. You want another one? A swear word every once in a while. Why not? You look at the TVs in America. Still, to today, there's bleep sound on yeah. the, the swear words. And then they sell guns at shops. It's just an example of how mm, yeah that's you know, a very, uh, you know that it's just an example of how we're trying to control things that are so meaningless they're so small i don't think but, uh, I, the world is going to go to yeah. shit because we hear a few swear words on tv on yeah. tennis players on on a movie the world is not going to shit if we're going to smash a record or two i'm, I'm going to sound like a real fuddy duddy here but again it's, it. it's bringing back to the kind of role model for children mm -hmm. if someone teaches are trying to teach kids don't swear it's just it's not imaginative it's rude if you think about it what you're saying is pretty disgusting to some people i suppose mm -hmm. yes um and then you hear djokovic I'm just pick, picking someone at random yeah, sure. swearing or Serena Williams swearing mm -hmm. on TV yeah. and it just undoes that lesson and then we all cheer at the end because they've won so it's almost like well they swore that that might have helped them win and that's a good thing to do do you see, do you see what I mean? So, uh, I think we're, we're too focused on role modelling have you okay. noticed that yeah. you are a cool dude you're right here in front of me and you were born and grew up in a stage of this human evolution that there was no rules against tennis swearing words and you're still a normal guy i think i'm uh, still a normal guy i have a that's all right a very life. interesting you uh, see my question. father my I father think, is yeah. from another generation my grandfather yeah. and they still had great lives yeah i don't i think swearing was banned when i was growing up on tv and i'm not sure that there wasn't um 
there wasn't a kind of delay in transmissions mm -hmm. because McEnroe must have sworn all the time at Wimbledon. But I never remember hearing him on TV and mm. thinking he'd, he'd sworn. Maybe it was my bad listening or the microphones weren't picking well, maybe up. Maybe you still didn't but know he'd what get, was... He'd get, he'd get what? a code violation. The umpire would go, uh, code violation, Mr. McEnroe, mm. ungentlemanly language. <laughs> yes. And McEnroe would always protest and go... I, I I didn't swear, and I'd, I'd, be, the, think, I'd yes. be thinking, I didn't hear you swear either, but it might have been bad hearing it's or bad microphones. It's always difficult to hear exactly so what they say from the TV. It That's wasn't bleeped out, thing. so I don't think there no. was a delay in transmission. Yeah. Look, one other thing about the swearing is there's mm. most times when somebody swears on the tennis court, I barely ever hear yeah, it. Yeah, we I only know yeah. of it because he gets a, a cold violation. But then again, the rackets were okay. And where I come from, other countries, Portugal and Asia and etc., I have a lot of friends that are normal human beings and they grew up in, in a generation where our parents would park the car and we would sit on top of the car and the car would go into the garage. And we just, there was a world <laughs> where we were free to express ourselves and dangers will always be there. So yeah. it's a big topic, this one. We could go on forever because I completely understand it's your side. Yeah, no, it's an interesting topic. But, I'm, uh, not, I'm uh, not disagreeing with you. I'm just trying to put across other people's... Exactly. You do well. You uh, do well because you're challenging what I'm saying. Of you, but um, a game like rugby, I don't know if you've ever watched. Yes, rugby, it's where they're true gentlemen. It's incredible. That, it is bizarre because it is such a violent game. And you know, you can break they... your neck. And yet the referee goes, number nine, come over here. Quick words. Don't do that. And if you do that and they take it, whereas in football, the footballer would not be taking it. No. In tennis, no, they, they don't take it at all. And the referees are mic'd up. So you can kind of hear a bit of what the player and the referee are talking about, yes. which really adds to the spectacle. Mm -hmm. And I think there's no swearing, partly because they're just so knackered. They, whereas in tennis, you are running around, it is knackering, but you're not knackered to the extent of a rugby player who is really, they've used up every fibre yes. of their being in would a very be, physical game. It's true. It would be great to have Stephen here with us because he's a rugby player. Yes, he's come <laughs> along. Yeah, he's chosen the wrong one to miss there. <laughs> yes. But yeah, it's a, so you think there's too much nanning and too much... Too much nanning. Uh, prescriptive we're, we're, rules. Yes, well, we're McEnroe's adults. idea was not to have an umpire to get the players. I know. And this is, again, reflecting <laughs> my earlier comment about That's crazy. should tennis and sport mirror real life? Because when I go to play you down in the public courts, yeah. an umpire doesn't come along to umpire nope. our matches. So maybe wouldn't it be nice if the pros... It would lead to far more arguments, and it's bizarre McEnroe suggesting that because he's the very player who needs an umpire. He does. But maybe he would have argued less if he was sorting it out with the guy the other end of the... Maybe they would end up punching each other. And well, the, I'm sure when Connor, there is a million yeah. dollars on the line, I think we need an umpire. And but it would be very interesting if they did have one Grand Slam tournament with no umpire hey, and no ball, ball boys or ball Doesn't girls. Even, yes, I love that. Doesn't even <laughs> have to be a Grand Slam. Just bring on a ATP 1000 like that. Well, when Agassi slid down the rankings, he uh, entered lesser tournaments and he'd flip over he'd flip over the scoreboard himself because yes. that's what players did at that level. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's all very interesting. I just miss that uh, that the world was a little bit, and specifically talking about tennis for now, now the world is a bit more easygoing and uh, we're putting too many rules into tennis. Some rules are great and I support them. Some I wish they've been gone. That's a very interesting, uh, interesting point. Both, both were very good, very interesting. Um, yeah, I couldn't say yes or no to each your thing because <laughs> I'm going to sleep on it. Yes. And I will let you know the next yeah, episode. Yeah, we'll talk about this again for sure. When we start the next episode, remind me and I'll, yeah. I'll give you an because answer. Because this, but... uh, this is a conversation that is even philosophical. It goes beyond tennis. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we'll, we'll carry on talking when the mics go off. Exactly. All right, so uh, Jim, thanks for coming. This was a very yeah, thank interesting you for me. episode. Yeah, it's it was like a good we one. could talk forever about this, so all these topics. We've had eight episodes. A number mm -hmm. of uh, number of times, Djokovic has won the Australian Open. Boom! So eight is the magic number. <laughs> yes, it's past eight, past our bedtime now. Right. Just just past eight o'clock, isn't it? <laughs> so on that symmetry, we we'll bid you bid you all farewell. Yeah, see you later. Good night.